Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Kyla McFarlane, Curator of Academic Programs Research at the Ian Potter Museum of Art at the University of Melbourne. I'm our MC for this afternoon and curator of this machine interdisciplinary online forum, which is the third in an ongoing series developed in collaboration with Dr. Danny Butt, Associate Director Research at the Victorian College of the Arts, Faculty of Fine Art and Music at the University of Melbourne. Thank you so much, Danny, for your collegial and insightful collaboration. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from Wurundjeri land in Kensington, Melbourne, near the Maribyrnong River. And thank you so much for joining us on Zoom from wherever you are. This is the final of three webinars we've presented across the week. If you'd like to access recordings of all sessions, please do check the Potter website where they'll be available in the coming weeks or join our email list. I'd now like to welcome to the session, Kelly Galatley, Director of the Ian Potter Museum of Art. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Carla, thanks so much. As Carla said, I'm Kelly Galatley, Director of the Potter, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to the Machine Interdisciplinary Forum. As Carla noted, it's one of a series of forums that we're undertaking at the Potter that propose art making as a form of knowledge creation alongside other academic fields of inquiry and which feature a range of our academic colleagues from across the University of Melbourne. On behalf of the Ian Potter Museum of Art and the University, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the Potter Museum is located on the University of Melbourne's Parkville campus, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I also extend that respect to any First Nations persons joining us today, whether from within Australia or further abroad. I'm joining you via Zoom from, Zoom from Wurundjeri land in Melbourne's east, close to Mullum Mullum Creek, and I also pay my respect to the Indigenous elders of my local area. Each of our forums has sought to address pressing themes of our time from interdisciplinary perspectives. Previous forums have explored water and language, and now we come to machine. Today, as we experience rapidly expanding developments in areas such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, data and algorithms are increasingly impacting our daily lives. From simulating human intelligence to collecting our personal data, the machine of the computer system engages us as individuals, communities and societies, both as creators and as consumers. Presenting a diverse program of speakers from a range of disciplines over three afternoons, and sadly, as Carla said, this is our last session, Machine is investigating the interface between humanity and machine across fields of research, including digital ethics, data analytics, creative writing, visual art, and mathematics. So now to today's session three. We're going to hear from Sean Dockray and Kate smith Miles, and it's my pleasure to introduce them to you now. Sean Dockray is an artist and writer whose work explores the politics of technology with a particular emphasis on artificial intelligences and algorithmic web. He's a founding director of the Los Angeles nonprofit Telic Arts Exchange and initiator of knowledge sharing platforms, the public school and arg.org. Sean's a lecturer in sculpture and spatial practice at the Australian National University in Canberra and is currently researching the rise of listening machines. As part of this forum, uh, we commissioned Sean to produce an online artwork, Listening to the Diagnostic Ear, which we'll speak about today and which will be accessible on the Potter website from today as well. Following Sean's talk, we'll be joined by Kate Smith-Miles, who's a Professor of Applied Mathematics and Australian Laureate Fellow at the University of Melbourne. Kate graduated from the University of Melbourne with a Bachelor of Science Honours in Mathematics and a PhD in Electrical Engineering before commencing her academic career in 1996 at Monash University. Returning to the University of Melbourne in 2017, she's currently Associate Dean Enterprise and Innovation for the Faculty of Science and Director of the ARC Industrial Transformation Training Centre for Optimization Technologies, Integrated Methodologies and Applications, aka Optima. Passionate about interdisciplinary applications of mathematics, Eugentropy Triptych presents Kate's first foray into the visual arts. 
Kate's talk is titled Generating Beautiful Intricacy via Self-Evolving Mathematical Functions. We're also pleased and honoured to have Niels Wooters Research Fellow, Interaction Design Lab, School of Computing and Information Systems in the Melbourne School of Engineering at the University of Melbourne as our session respondent this afternoon. As well as having one of the longest titles on the planet, Niels is also the Head of Research and Emerging Practice for Science Gallery Melbourne. Following Sean and Kate's presentations, Niels will respond and lead a Q&A with our panellists. And it's now my delight to hand over to Sean Dockray. Hi, thanks, Kelly. Um, thanks also to Kyla, um, to the Potter, uh, to Danny Butt as well, uh, and also Ben um, and my co-panelists here, uh, Niels and Kate. Um, I'm really looking forward to this afternoon. Thanks to everyone who came. Uh, I see that there's, uh, I see a number of attendees. <laughs> um, instead of people. Um, I get really nervous before talks and I thought this is the first public presentation I've ever had to do like on Zoom. That's not sort of just like talking or teaching or something. And I was wondering how it would go. And it turns out that I still get really nervous. <laughs> so it's, a, it's really an odd thing to, um, to be sort of alone in a room that I work in every day and, um, and to feel my heart rate <laughs> sort of accelerating and my palms getting sweaty and my throat getting dry and all that stuff because it feels just so uh, out of sync with the room that I'm in. Um, I do want to uh, acknowledge that I'm also on Orangery land. Although I teach in Canberra, I uh, am a based here. I want to pay my respects uh, to elders past and present um, and also extend my respect to any First Nations people who are watching today or who might be watching uh, this recording in the future. Um, the thinking behind the project that I'm going to be talking about um, has been sort of developing over some years, but especially over the last few months um, uh, with, uh, in, a, in a project that I've been um, working on on machine listening with um, James Parker and Joel Stern. So I do want to acknowledge uh, them because they are firmly rooted in the, the sort of genesis of this uh, and also to thank Liquid Architecture um, for conversations along the way. <clears throat> uh, this talk uh, that I'm going to give uh, right now is uh, I sort of see as part of uh, the work that I'm showing. So it's not really a talk about the work, it's, uh, it's sort of part of the work. So I'm gonna take us uh, on a tour through a data set. There isn't a doorway or an entrance, so let's start chronologically at the beginning. In the waning hours of March 18th of this year, a six foot three inch 44 year old man in America gave his web browser permission to access his microphone. Every indication is that he feels quite well. His temperature is 36.5 degrees Celsius and the website which has requested this permission prompts him to cough three times. First little glitch. <coughs> he complies and thus begins the Corona voice detect data set. The, the data set's parentage is complex. It's the offspring of an Israeli inventor, a New York based startup that makes synthetic call center assistance based on artificial intelligence and a team at Carnegie Mellon University specializing in voice forensics. The inventor is especially promiscuous. His biography is largely a running count of his patents, which includes, among hundreds of others, starting a simulation from a real situation with application in sporting events and military battlefields. Their idea is to collect a data set of voice <coughs> samples, including coughs, <coughs> to build a program that would identify coronavirus infections from the sound we make. This program would hear COVID days before <laughs> symptoms appear. In many ways, I'm persuaded okay. by the promise of I'm this project. And I'm fine. Okay. A test from my own home <laughs> or wherever I happen to be. A test that doesn't violate my nasal cavity. Hi. A test that protects healthcare workers. <coughs> Just checking. <coughs> 
test that gets to people who are, who are systematically excluded from testing. And when you listen to the data set, you sometimes hear people breaking the rules, pushing hey, back on the prompts. Homies, what's up? Hey, homies, what's up? Not as defiance, but to express a desire for something. Hello, hello. I'm trying to understand if I have COVID-19. Hello, hello, hello. Do I have COVID-19? It's as if recording one's cough is a civic duty, a call to action. Help us stop COVID-19, the website says. Submitting my voice recording for the uh, Corona Voice AI uh, technology that you guys are developing. I hope this helps you in finding the cure and my data sample helps you. Thank you. It's the promise of a quick technological fix that demands very little sacrifice, at least in terms of effort or conscious thought. Even still, it's remarkable how willing people have been to hand over their biometric data without limitation to the startup Voca AI, which built the website. <coughs> Corona Voice Detect is not the only such project. The COVID-19 Sounds app, COVID-19 Detection by Coffin Voice Analysis, the city of Mumbai, Kas, which means cough in Sanskrit, is a project by a startup in India. Vocalis in partnership with Neuralex, which was just bought by Sonda Health, and also Vocalis in partnership with the Israeli Ministry of Defense. Those are just a few of these projects. COVID testing is a $44 billion market. And unsurprisingly, COVID is the nail for a thousand machine learning hammers. Projects based on the theory that machines can listen to vocal bio biomarkers to detect, among other things, psychosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, depression, among other conditions, have been adapted in the way that so many of our lives and projects have been um, to COVID. A 2008 voice analytics program, for instance, for diagnosing tuberculosis from a group of uh, Navi engineering students in Mumbai was retuned, they said, to detect COVID. Um, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, uh, in a recent conversation, connected this to the history of the stethoscope or any practice of auscultation, of listening directly to the body rather than the words of the patient. Etienne Jules Marais anticipates the surrealist method of automatic writing when his instruments translate the inner life of the body into graphic traces. The subject is not to be trusted or is not up to the task of accounting for themselves. Even if disingenuous David Applebaum wrote in his book on voice, however, the cough vocalically expresses the body, that is the habitat, and perhaps a trace of its sometimes inhabitant, the person. So the cough tells its own story. It gives us a way, not just in the way that the cough from behind the curtain betrays the one who's hiding there, but, and this is Applebaum again, to the oscilloscope, the cough is as reliable a mark of individuality as any voice print. The cough and the diagnostic ear that now listens to it is situated within a wider political economic context of privatized care, insurance, pharmaceuticals, fitness, as well as weakened labor, hyper-individualized marketing, restricted movement, and restrictions on protest. These things have been going on for a long time, but omnivorous, rapacious corporate surveillance accelerates, retunes, and amplifies their effect. In George Orwell's novel, 1984, the telescreen is the vehicle for universal surveillance. It's the eye through which Big Brother watches. But it's a two-way device. 
Every morning, Winston <laughs> awakes to a motivational disciplinary exercise regime, which frankly reminds me of a Zoom session. And that sends him, that exercise regime sends him into a coughing fit. One morning, he sits down for work and sighs audibly. Um, he is immediately conscious of the message that this might send because of the telescreen's microphone. See, Orwell calls this microphone a never sleeping ear, much like Amazon's Alexa, which despite having a wake word is always listening. The telescreen's microphone is sensitive enough to pick up not only nervous breathing, but also a heartbeat, which incidentally can give away your identity like a fingerprint. And that quote is from Cardio ID, a startup that wants to integrate EC ECG biometrics into steering wheels, not 1984, by the way. Because 1984 is preoccupied with liberal values of individuality and privacy, the surveillance is always revealing one's identity, location, or thoughts. A rapid heartbeat gives away an illicit plan. Winston's coughs, however, are superfluous. They're of no real value to Big Brother. And this fits with the place of the cough in philosophy, which is to say that it has no place. Aristotle's cough does not rise to the level of voice because it has no meaning. It's unintentional. <coughs> but coughs often do have meaning. Stephen Connor posits a thesaurus or prosody of coughing and Madan Dola identifies the semiotics of coughing. For example, when I'm getting ready to speak, <laughs> Or when I want to make clear room in the conversation to speak. To delay while I think. As an ironic rejoinder. To let you know that I'm here. To relieve the tension building in the silence. In spite of all this meaning and signification, the cough is detritus. It's just a symptom. Applebaum asks, the coughs of a man's life may be, num may be as numbered as his days and words, but are they similarly recorded? <coughs> now and tomorrow, yes. But in 1948, no. George Orwell didn't anticipate the recording of coughs. He didn't anticipate many things. In a review, Isaac Asimov wrote that if 1984 is to be considered science fiction at all, then it is very bad science fiction. Among the book's many faults, Asimov writes that Orwell was unable to conceive of computers or robots, or he would have placed everyone under non-human surveillance. But Asimov himself was wrong here, because where he saw possibility, he couldn't see the political will. But here we are. Our devices watch and listen to us, feeding data into aggregated complex cross-correlated databases that train neural networks to identify, classify, recommend, and predict. 1984 was set 36, into the 36 years into the future from 1948. And if we jump ahead another 36 years to 2020, we might imagine an alternative story that Orwell might have written with the cough at the center. You see, George Orwell had been diagnosed with chronic tuberculosis as he worked on 1984. He received some of the standard treatment of the day. They collapsed his lung and paralyzed his diaphragm. He spent time in a sanitarium. And while his condition slowly deteriorated, news came from America of an experimental treatment. It hadn't passed a formal trial, but had been rushed to market as a miracle drug, streptomycin. <coughs> Only the UK couldn't get very much, and Orwell was deemed too old at 44 to qualify for it. And even if he hadn't been too old, none of the drug was distributed to Scotland anyway. And even if all that weren't a problem, there was panic buying in black <coughs> markets, which, might, which we might recognize today and hydroxychloroquine. So Orwell mobilized his social and political connections. 
using his liquidity in America to buy and import st streptomycin. George Orwell became the first person in Scotland Please to get to try it. To stop. This is already the outline of a story. Torturous treatments, international finance, the politics of medication along the lines of class and race. And it becomes horrific. Orwell awakes each morning with his lips sealed with the dried blood from the blisters in his throat. His fingernails and toenails fall out. His hair falls out too in black patches that grow back white. Orwell might have written about how capitalism accelerates the disease. During the Industrial Revolution, millions migrated from the countryside into growing industrial cities, and tuberculosis thrived there, taking the lives of one out of every three people. And if we try to listen to the industrial city, it probably sounds something like this. <coughs> but aren't insecure workers in this position today? with bosses and landlords that give no relief without getting it first. Workers are compelled to face the virus with the knowledge that others might be victim or executioner. Martin O'Brien, an artist uh, with cystic fibrosis, who's written um, a really excellent uh, paper that's under peer review now, describes the zombie time that now characterizes our world, a world in which we're unable to be together. So in the alternative story, which turns out to be our present, Orwell could have written about Downing Street scientific advisors who fear that people might intentionally seek to contract coronavirus and that a black market and fake test results could emerge if employers allowed workers to return only when they had a positive antibody test. So are they afraid that workers will be forever contagious and therefore absent, a never ending wildcat sick day? Or is the problem that rather workers without job and wage security will bring the virus to work rather than risk personal financial ruin? To circumvent this black market for fake test results, a corporation, maybe Voca AI, offers a new type of testing. All you have to do is cough and you and your employer get the verified results instantly, but a new black market develops. This one is for a device with a small knob, a speaker, and a line output. It generates fake coughs that will be diagnosed with a certain specific probability of COVID. If you turn the dial down, the cough is confidently clear of the virus. And when the knob is turned in the opposite direction, a very sick cough is played. An arms race ensues with no clear conclusion. But all along, it's the ones with the technological upper hand who get the diagnosis they want. <coughs> One day, someone from the synthetic call center division of Voca AI hears about the fake coughs. Could we do that, they wonder. The automated agents, whose voice was already quite realistic in texture and prosody, was still missing something. The lisps, the sighs, the rasp, the sniffle, the cough. And not long after every phone conversation with an insurance representative or about the benefits, because there were a lot of unemployed people making a lot of calls, were interrupted by at least one fake cough. In 1948, two thirty-six years le leaps back from today, Orwell wrote about one of his doctors. There were many beds past which he walked day after day, sometimes followed by imploring cries. On the other hand, if you had some kind of disease with which the students wanted to familiarize themselves, you got plenty of attention of a kind. I myself, with an exceptionally fine specimen of a bronchial rattle, sometimes had as many as a dozen students queuing up to listen to my chest. It was a very queer feeling. Queer, I mean, because of their intense interest in learning their jobs together with a seeming lack of perception that their patients were human beings. In 2020, it's maybe not doctors and their interns and their specimen patients, but inventors and their programmers and their training data. For them, the cough is valuable, but only an aggregate. 
When the faulty data is thrown out, when features have been extracted, when the accuracy scores get above 80%. Um, just uh, wrapping up now, but um, in the in the early 20th century, many writers died from tuberculosis. Franz Kafka, Anton Chekhov, Catherine Mansfield. And like Downing Street's paranoid fantasy of fake COVID tests, people with TB would often deny having it in for fear of being ostracized and isolated. Kafka and Chekhov lied to their families about having tuberculosis. Chekhov wrote at one point, I feel as though I'm in prison and full of rage, terrible rage. And for Mansfield, she wrote, this isolation is death to me. A cough in public would attract disapproving looks at least. A cough, air escaping us through a gash, uh, that's from Stephen Connor, can be so meaningful, but its meaning ultimately comes from the world that it escapes into. This data set, thousands of coughs from people isolated from one another by distance and emergency restrictions, in a political climate that desperately wants to automatically separate the healthy from the sick so that the economy resumes its thoughtless growth, and the sick never appear in the first place. If we listen to the coughs, they tell us not so much about the symptoms, but about the structure <coughs> that's learning to diagnose them and our place in it. And I'll just finish with uh, a, a poem that Catherine Mansfield wrote uh, called Malad while in isolation. Um, it goes, the man in the next room to mine has got the same complaint as I. When I wake in the night and hear him turning, then he coughs, and I cough, and he coughs again. And this goes on for a long time until I feel we are like two roosters calling to each other at a false dawn from far away hidden farms. <coughs> Sean, thank you so much for such a powerful and poignant talk and, and for sharing the insights of your own deep listening. It's been an absolute pleasure for us to commission listening to the Diagnostic Year and I'd encourage everyone to jump on the website after we've heard from Kate and you've participated um, in the Q&A this afternoon. And while you're there, I'd encourage you to have a look at a show that the Potter did in 2018 um, that was curated by Liquid Architecture's um, Joel Stern and our colleague James Parker from Melbourne Law School that also included Sean's work um, called Eavesdropping. It's now my great pleasure to hand over to Kate Smith-Miles for her talk, Generating Beautiful Intricacy via Self-Evolving Mathematical Functions. Thanks, Kate. So, um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to um, introduce this artwork, um, a digital unveiling, so to speak. Uh, this is artwork that was generated by a machine. Each individual mathematical function that makes up each one of those tiny images there was generated um, mathematically by a machine. Uh, but there's some human uh, judgment and aesthetic considerations that have gone into the construction of the whole piece, which we call Negentropy Triptych. So this is a collaboration between me and my colleague, Mario Andres. Uh, so what I'd like to do, um, we did not set about trying to create a, any kind of artwork. Uh, this was an unexpected outcome from a mathematics research project. Uh, the scientific motivation, what, what were our scientific aims, the methods we introduced and the results? Um, you've got to hang in there. Uh, I'll keep the mathematics to a minimum um, before we then talk about the, the artistic motivation uh, and the aesthetic considerations that went into the construction of the gentropy triptych. So the scientific motivation, what I'm interested in um, as a mathematician is um, algorithms. And algorithms are simply uh, a set of rules that machines use to solve problems. And so those algorithms could be things such as um, uh, face recognition, um, trying to figure out who you are or how old you are or your gender. 
or your emotions uh, from a face. It could be something like uh, stock market prediction, uh, trying to decide uh, trading algorithms, whether you should buy or sell stocks. But do it doesn't really matter what the algorithm is trying to do. What I'm interested in is how do we know if an algorithm can be trusted? And so how do we trust an algorithm? Well, you wouldn't trust an algorithm unless it gives you the right answers to problems where you know the answer already. So suppose you have an algorithm and you give it a, an example and it gets the right answer and you give it another example to test it and it gets the right answer and so it goes and you might start to believe that this algorithm is pretty good, pretty trustworthy. And then you might finally find some examples where it's giving the wrong answer and you might have discovered a weakness, right? But you may only have uh, given it the first few examples and you, you might be misleaded, misled into thinking that it's actually a good algorithm. So it really depends on, on how rigorously you test. There might be another algorithm where very quickly you can find some weaknesses, um, but both of these algorithm, algorithms might have different strengths and weaknesses. So what we're trying to do is expose an algorithm's weaknesses, um, but that really depends on our choice of test examples and the diversity, not just the number of examples we give it, but the diversity of those test examples. So that's what we're interested in, trying to reveal an algorithm's weakness. And randomly chosen test problems may not actually be difficult for an algorithm. You may not discover its weakness by doing that. Our question is, can we get computers to search for examples that an algorithm can't solve? Essentially, what I'd love to be able to do is attach a warning label to an algorithm that says this algorithm should only be used for the scenarios most similar to those described in the terms and conditions to establish the guaranteed reliability. It would be great. We would all trust algorithms more if we understood the conditions under which our performance is guaranteed. So as a mathematician, that's what I'm interested in trying to do. And I'm going to talk now in a, about a particular type of algorithm, which is for solving optimization problems. What's an optimization problem? Well, most people have seen this in high school, uh, where you're trying to minimize a function. So here we have um, a decision we have to make, x. We have to choose the number x that makes this function, f of x, some function of x, as small as possible. So you can see here this point in green is a minimum of the function. There's also another minimum of the function over here. It's called a local minimum, but it's not as good as this one down here that really minimizes the function. So back in high school, I was just helping my, my year 10 son with his um, homeschooling uh, quadratic equations. You know, you've got a quadratic, you know how to find the turning point of that quadratic. Um, you also know how to find the roots uh, where it passes through zero. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated than, than a quadratic function. Um, but the challenge is find the value of x that minimizes the function of x, right? Find the x value that gives us the minimum. But you have to watch out for traps, including these local minima. You don't, this one you might think that you've reached the bottom because it's a turning point, but it's not the absolute best solution. So just to help uh, with a motivating application, suppose you're a retailer like a supermarket and you're trying to decide how many items of a particular product you want to stock uh, in order to minimize your costs, right? Now you might just think the more items I have, then the, uh, the, the, le the least cost I've got because I can sell more items and make more profit. But you've got to understand that there's other considerations such as um, what if you have perish, if this item is a perishable item and you, if you end up stocking too many and you can't sell them in time, you have to throw them out. So you've wasted money. And there's also inventory costs. There's, there comes a point where you may not, um, you may incur additional costs to store those extra items somewhere else. So that's why we get this wobbly curve. Um, and it's not sometimes obvious what the optimal answer is. And you need mathematical algorithms to solve this problem. And now this is um, a two dimensional decision space. Suppose I, I've got two products, one product and another product, and I'm trying to work out the optimal combination of these two products to minimize my cost. So now we have this two dimension, but you can imagine Woolworths does not have two products on the shelf. So you can imagine how these optimization problems get huge and you need very powerful uh, mathematical algorithms to, to solve such real world problems. That six hump camelback function, uh, we're now trying to find the values, the pair X, Y that minimizes this function. And another way of looking at it is from above, right? So if you just stood above it and looked down, you would just get this two dimensional contour plot of if I choose a value for X and a value for Y, what is the function value? And if we're minimizing, we are trying to find the deepest blue. The darkest blue is the smallest value of this function. So the job of an optimization algorithm is to search this space and try to find the deepest blue. 
And you can think of this in terms of a, a landscape and imagine the deepest blue is like the bottom of a, a valley or a river. Okay, so in a nutshell, that's optimization, and we're looking at algorithms that can solve these problems. And I've I said before that our confidence in our trust in an algorithm just depends on how well we test it. So suppose we have these test problems. These are very well-known test problems. The first one up here, I'll just say, is easy for all algorithms. All algorithms will find the very best, the deepest blue, very easily. It just rolls downhill, and it's, it's confident that it's found the minimum of that function. This one over here is going to be easy for most algorithms, but some will get stuck in these little plateaus, these flat regions, and it won't realize that there's a deeper blue further down. This one over here, uh, the third one is hard for most algorithms because you can see how many little local minima there are, and some of them are deeper than others, but an algorithm will easily get trapped in many of these little traps here. And the final one is hard for most algorithms, but for a different reason. Um, many algorithms won't even know what they don't know. They won't even realize. Um, they think that they've, they've tried uh, finding the solution from many different initial guesses and they've rolled down and they've got stuck and they think that it actually looks like the first one, but they don't even realize that it's uh, got multiple, um, opt multiple optima. So these are some of the classic test examples. And what we've done is generated some brand new test examples. Um, we've done this because we want to understand what makes optimization problems difficult for algorithms to solve. So you can already see from those pictures that characteristics such as ruggedness, how rugged the landscape is, whether there's flat plateaus that can kind of mislead you, uh, dependency between variables, these are all things that make the optimization algorithm uh, struggle sometimes. Um, the other thought is how do we actually see the difficulty of that problem? I just showed you some 3D pictures, but what if we had 200 dimensions? How do we actually see that? How do we understand whether this is going to be a difficult problem or an easy problem for an algorithm? So I'm going to skip all the details, but for our mathematics project uh, has developed an approach called instance space analysis, where we project all the functions as points in a 2D plane uh, based on their similarities and differences in those characteristics. Uh, we use some statistical techniques to estimate um, eight key characteristics of these functions like ruggedness and plateaus uh, based on a sample of points. Uh, so every function now can be summarized as a unique eight dimensional feature vector. And then we project that to 2D using some linear algebra. The details are not important, but in the end, we end up with a nice 2D map that I'm about to show you where we can analyze all the different functions that are out there that we study. And we can also see where there's great big gaps in the space where we would benefit from um, generating some new functions. So here's an instance space for optimization problems. The blue points are functions like some of the ones we just saw. The blue points are functions that exist already and everybody tests their optimization algorithms on. The red ones are functions that we have evolved and I'll talk about what I mean by evolved in a minute. Functions that we have evolved using um, machine learning techniques to um, clone those functions or to, to imitate those functions. And then the green ones are brand new functions that we have evolved to fill the vast expanse of the instance space with brand new functions that no one has seen before. And it is those functions, the green ones, that form the foundation for our artwork that I'm getting to. But before that, what do I mean by evolving functions? Well, that's Charles Darwin and Charles Darwin um, has created great inspiration for computer scientists in, in the last few decades. Darwin's um, premise of natural selection and survival of the fittest is, of course, uh, where individuals are animal species, humans or, or lions or something, and the individuals are parents who reproduce to create offspring and the offspring inherit characteristics or traits of both parents and then, of course, there's some mutation that happens. So we use a lot of genetic language. Um, but in the end, you've got this next generation of children and only the fittest ones will survive to become parents themselves and have their superior genetic material pass on to the next generation. Uh, and so it goes. And so that survival of the fittest premise means that the average fitness of the population is increasing over time. So that was Charles Darwin's um, natural selection and survival of the fittest. We take inspiration from that to um, evolve functions using what's called genetic programming. So in this case, instead of individuals being animal species, an individual is now a tree structure that defines a mathematical function. 
So if we have a look at this example over here, this function down here, 2.2 minus x divided by 11 plus seven times cos of y, very simple function just using arithmetic and trigonometric operators. But as a tree structure, we have 2.2 minus x divided by 11 on the left branch of the tree, which is then added to the right branch of the tree, which says seven times cos of y. So we're basically taking an x and a y, our two variables, and we are creating a function of x and y embedded within a tree structure. So if that was mum, and then we have another one kind of like that, but different for dad, then mum and dad can produce uh, two children or as many children as we want just by combining their branches together and then applying uh, random mutations. So I might change this 2.2 to a 9.8, or I might change this plus sign to a, a subtraction, or it might change cos to sine. So there's random mutations that can happen as well as um, crossing over characteristics from both parents to create the next generation. The fitness of those children is going to get better on average over time based on something that we are measuring about them and using to select which ones become parents. So that's the basic idea that weak functions, functions that don't meet my criteria of what I'm trying to achieve will die out and the average fitness of functions improves over time. And we simulate this evolutionary process on computers. Uh, we can simulate many, many generations in just seconds. So that's how we would evolve a mathematical function using genetic programming. And then the only last thing I need to tell you is what I mean by a fit function. What am I trying to achieve as an evolutionary goal here? I'm trying to create new functions that live at all of those um, diverse locations in my instance space, those green dots. I want functions that we have never seen before, brand new mathematical functions that no one has studied. We want to test optimization algorithms on those functions. So if I set a goal that I want to fill that space with brand new functions that no one has seen before, then that's how I define my fitness. An individual is fit and therefore they will survive the evolutionary process if they live in an area of that instance space close to my target. So I set a goal. I want a function that lives here. Give me a function that lives there. Uh, so that's to ensure that I've got diversity and a comprehensive set of test examples so that I can try to understand what the weaknesses of algorithms are. And just uh, little technical details of how we actually do that. So we measure fitness based on distance to a target point. Um, so for a given offspring, I calculate that eight dimensional feature vector, I project to 2D, I measure the distance, and the fittest individuals will be the ones that are closest to the target point. If they're very close, they will survive. If they're too far away, they will die off. So over time, I get functions that live anywhere I ask them to live in that space. So remember, I have the blue points that are existing functions. So I could say, give me some functions, evolve me, starting from random nothing, evolve me some functions that live right on top of the blue functions. Or I could say, I want to see some brand new functions in unexplored territory. So let me show you some examples of these functions. So um, the red ones are clones, clones of functions we already know. So this is really used just to confirm that our methodology is correct. We did a, like a controlled experiment can I reproduce existing functions? And then I'll show you some of the green brand new ones. Okay, so the top row here, the top three images, the one on the left is an existing function. Um, remember blue means a, a low value and red means high. We've got the color scale over here from blue through green, yellow to, to red. So this is kind of like a river running through a very steep valley with these contour plots. You're looking at this from above. So that's the target function. I'm trying to clone this function. The one on, in the middle is in my final generation. So after I simulate this evolutionary process for say 200 generations, and I look at the, the final generation of children, and I say, what is my worst child like? Right? If I've said, I want you to look like this steep valley, what is my worst child like in that generation? And this is, this is the worst child. Right, So it's supposed to have characteristics of this target, and it kind of does. It's a little wiggly, but you can still see it's clearly a river in a steep valley. And uh, this, sorry, that, sorry, the other way around. That is my best child, and this one on the right is my worst child. So you can see that it's got many of the characteristics. It's got, got some little weird little hills over here. But really, this whole family of functions that we've generated 
to look like the target. It's a little bit like you've got a river down there and you've got these terraces like rice paddy. It, it, each one of these red, um, slightly different shaded reds is kind of like these ter terraces. So you can see why this would actually be hard for an optimization algorithm because the optimization algorithm is trying to find the river down the bottom, but it might get stuck on one of these ledges and it looks around and it sees nothing in its little area because it's quite myopic. It sees nothing but flatness and it thinks, oh, I'm done. This is as low as I can go. And it doesn't realize it just needs to keep searching a bit further to fall down a step. So this creates challenges for optimization algorithms and we've been able to replicate similarly challenging problems. This one in the second row is relatively easy. It's just the bowl. The minimum is down the bottom. And we say, okay, this is my best attempt to evolve a bowl. And this is my worst attempt. It's a little wiggly, but it's got the same basic idea. So it's kind of like a crater here. But the interesting thing is that this one, this is my worst child attempting to be a bowl. This is its equation. So while this bowl might just be like X squared plus Y squared, plus maybe some offset terms, maybe the first five terms might describe this one. The genetic programming has gone overboard and it's created all these extra terms because we gave it the language to do it. It's created all these extra terms that create a function that's similar, but different, but it's got the same broad characteristics. Um, and, and certainly the, the best child that we created was a lot more similar to that one. So that's confirmation that the methodology is right. We've succeeded in uh, cloning existing functions. Now let's let it loose on the rest of the space. Let's see what um, new functions we can create. So these are some of the functions that we managed to generate that look completely different from existing benchmark problems that people in the literature use to, to test their algorithms. Remember the challenge is to find the deepest blue. So if you're an optimization algorithm, and you're going to get trapped in anything that looks like a little local minima, you can see why these would have some, you know, traps for, for optimization algorithms. So we published our paper in the evolutionary computation journal, um, MIT press um, just recently, actually it was um, published, but you know, and, and so we feel like we've made a great contribution to the literature. We've produced all these hundreds and hundreds of new benchmark problems that people can test their algorithms on. But the thing is, there were so many beautifully intricate functions that we were kind of astonished at how beautiful they were, especially when we decided to not go up to red, when we made the maximum color yellow, uh, even more beautiful. Uh, so many beautiful functions here. I mean, just look at the intricate detail of these functions. It's a, it's a shame to have them hidden in a paper. And in the paper, we couldn't even uh, present very many of them. I mean, just look at all of this detail. Um, I'm running out of time uh, to linger on any of these, but they're just stunningly beautiful. And of course, I wanted to print some. I wanted to print some for my wall and I couldn't decide um, which ones were most beautiful because I was now seeing this as art, not just mathematics. And of course, the relationship between art and maths is, is well known. Uh, so when I started asking my friends and family, um, which one of these 306 functions do you like the best? Um, everyone had a different opinion to the point where I just decided that I couldn't possibly choose one. Why don't we create an array of them? So this is a 17 by 18 grid of our 306 functions. But then there's a question about how to randomly arrange these functions in an aesthetically pleasing way. Um, and it seems that it's very subjective. So uh, I started randomly um, rearranging them and asking people which ones they preferred. And uh, it really depends on the value that an individual person places on order versus randomness, uh, which is, which you know, I started to notice correlated quite well with some aspects of personality. Um, so this is um, how we set about to create Nage entropy triptych. So the name uh, in physics entropy is just a lack of order or predictability or a gradual decline into disorder. Nage entropy is the negative of entropy. It's the reverse where order emerges from randomness. And so we have here in the middle, a random placement of the 306 functions. Um, but random doesn't ever look random to our eye, right? Random here, it's actually got a cross and you can see some of these dark blue in a row. It's not aesthetically convincing as random. Uh, so here is if we do some swaps, um, actually, you know, use our eyes to move some things around to create something that looks more random. And here is where we do some swaps on the right to actually enhance 
can you see the start of a, a background? See the blue cross? It's almost like there's a river that could potentially run through and connect some of these images together that we have enhanced over on the right. So a lot of um, some swaps to create a global structure, a connection between the individual images. Um, and so, and the triptych is just the emergence of order from randomness. So that's the digital unveiling of Negentropy Triptych. Um, and I would like to acknowledge the Australian Research Council for funding the mathematics research project that gave rise to this unexpected um, mathematics, uh, unexpected artwork. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you so much, Sean and Kate. Um, I'm absolutely blown away. I've got so many questions. Uh, I don't even know where to start, really. I also caught myself coughing a lot more during this panel discussion than I hope, at least, that I hope that I've ever coughed before. I don't know if I'm the only one, um, but I feel that coughing might be the next yawning uh, and the, the sort of contagious effect that that has on people. Um, but yeah, beautiful work. Um, yeah, as I said, really blown away. Um, just a heads up to all our participants and attendees, feel free to fire off all questions, ideas, suggestions, comments you have in the Q&A box, um, and I'll, I'll pass them on to Kate and Sean as we, as we go along. Um, Sean, perhaps as a sort of starter, um, I'd, I'd like to link back to um, your other work, Always Learning, back in, I think it was 2018. Um, and you, you've touched so much on these concepts of surveillance, um, and I think especially these days, uh, we are going through a time where surveillance is ever more ubiquitous. Um, how does Diagnostic Ear sort of connect or interplay with that discourse of today about machine learning, data analysis, surveillance, um, I guess, yeah, even this sort of omnipresent availability of, of medical data visualizations and COVID data visualizations, you've visualized cuffs in a fairly, um, with all due respect, a fairly straightforward manner. And I think that's also the type of data visualizations we're confronted with today. Um, yeah, how, how do both works connect or not with each other? Um, yeah. Good, good question. Thank you, Niels. Um, thanks, Kate, for your uh, presentation. I learned quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> um, um, so, to, to uh, in case, um, to, to, just to go back to that uh, work, uh, always learning. That was um, that was uh, an installation that sort of staged a conversation between um, three smart speaker devices from the three different um, sort of corporate pl cl cloud platforms, uh, uh, Amazon, Google, and Apple. Um, and through that conversation, they, they sort of, uh, they, I mean, they, they covered quite a lot of uh, discursive territory, uh, occasionally surveillance, but not exclusively. And I think that's, that's sort of just, just to touch on the point on surveillance. Um, I'm definitely interested in, in surveillance, but I think that, that, um, for me, it's more the 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 the, the kind of society that 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 that, um, that makes use of of surveillance and what it puts it to use for. I think that's probably what compels um, me, and and so those uh, that work in particular um, a little bit more. And that is something that I tried to I think talk about with um, the the diagnostic ear. Um, you're absolutely right. It's a straightforward visual. I tried to make it as kind of um, generic almost as possible like you're looking at a um, almost like you're looking just at a, a, a forgettable chart you know that it, it has almost no character uh, but then you know uh, when, when, once you get into the individual dots you know the, the, that that's where the character is um, and the, the the health data like what it, yeah the to connect the two works and come around to finally maybe trying to touch on your question um, how does the health, yeah, what, what, how is that health data um, kind of put to use? How does it function within um, um, 
the society that we're in? And I think that's, you know, that's an, an emergent question. It's a, I think that's why it's important to think about it now, because you sort of see all these structures taking, play, taking shape and um, you see lots of different actors angling to get in position, some much better resourced than others. You know, the, the world's richest man became so, so, so much richer, you know, um, during this pandemic. Um, and he's also marketing one of these smart speakers, right? The Amazon, uh, the Echo line and, and all of the Alexa products. So uh, I think it, it behooves us to think about what it means that there are these coughing databases uh, and the aggregation of health data and how does it fit into this, um, this um, um, you know, the, 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 the entire, I don't even know what to call it, but that the, the, the structure that includes all of these like devices that we have in our homes and our pockets around the city um, that are connected to our credit card information and so on. And to me, the problem isn't so much just that they're surveilling us, but, but just the types of decisions that are you know, taken um, uh, out of our hands or the hands of political processes that, you know, um, so the, the, the ways in which we're sort of like disempowered from um, be, be, be because of them. But I'm, I'm going on quite, quite enough, I think, so I'll leave it there. No, I think it's, it's a really nice segue into the world of algorithms and the real world application of algorithms. Um, Kate, obviously, yeah, you touched so heavily on optimization and optimization algorithms that um, you're unpacking and aesthetically representing. Um, can you just um, elaborate on, on why it is so important, uh, important sorry, for algorithms to not be faulty or not be biased? Yeah, so I mean, what I presented today was just about optimization algorithms because it gave rise to this beautiful artwork. But a lot of what I've been doing uh, all through the last five years of my Laureate project has been focusing on optimizations that arise in very many different application areas. Um, so this could be um, optimization, like could be algorithms for machine learning. So for instance, classifying people as COVID or not based on their cough. Not that we've done that, but you know, that, that's the kind of algorithm that could be, at, um, you know, Sean mentioned neural networks, for instance, that can analyze this data. Well, do we trust them? Um, there are algorithms for, you know, anomaly detection or, or so many different, different algorithms. But one of the, um, you know, I had a picture of a woman with the dots on her face, right? And, and I know, Niels, you've done the stuff with the biometric uh, mirror. Um, you know, facial recognition algorithms are a huge um, controversy, I suppose, um, because of the potential applications of them and the consequences for algorithms getting it wrong. So, you know, the media has been filled with examples where an algorithm incorrectly identified a person through a video surveillance camera as um, a suspect for a theft or something in a department store, and that person was arrested, and it turns out it wasn't them at all, it was a faulty algorithm. Now, the kind of bias that we see in algorithms um, has been brought into question a lot lately, particularly the question of whether algorithms are biased because of the way they've been trained, the lack of diversity in the example. So I'm talking a lot about the importance of diversity and the methodology that I've created that I barely scratched the surface of discussing today with this instance space is designed to ensure that the test examples that we're subjecting an algorithm to are as diverse and demonstrably diverse as possible. And what you find, I mean, I had a piece of work in 2007 where we developed algorithms for guessing how old you are based on your face. And our paper was published in the top journal in 2007. We were leading the world in terms of this sort of global competition of how accurately you could guess how old someone is. There were these databases and you were like a thousand faces and, and how accurately could you guess how old someone was. Our algorithm was leading the world. We published the paper in the top journal. Just this year, I've revisited that work in light of our new instant space analysis, how we can, what I call stress test algorithms. And I've subjected our algorithm that was leading the world back then. Um, and I've revealed through this instant space analysis that actually our algorithm was biased. Um, and it's not our algorithm's fault. The data we trained it on was very biased. Um, the, the data that we trained it on, a thousand images sounds like a big number, right? But it's not the number that matters, it's the diversity. And what we've found is that our algorithm has a bias. It's very accurate on guessing how old you are if you're like under 30, but not so good on the older faces because it just hadn't seen that many examples because that database was generated in a university environment from researchers that said, 
oh, I need some photos of um, all my colleagues at various stages throughout their life. And they're all in their 20s and 30s. So they've all got the baby photos and the teenage photos in the 20s and 30s. They can't see into the future yet, right? And there's not many people working in university computer science departments that are in their 70s and 80s. So we just don't have that many old people's faces. So the, the algorithms were trained and very inaccurate for old people. That's bias. Mm. And I guess to bring it back to uh, COVID and cuffs, um, and I'm sure, Sean, or I guess you will at some point be confronted with the question, uh, how many cough samples do you actually need to accurately detect whether or not someone has um, COVID? I guess we've got a mathematician here on the panel and we've got you, Sean. So it'd be, and it's a question that I've been confronted with as well in a slightly different context as well. And I, I always give the same answer, but it'd be nice to hear from you what your thoughts are on that specific aspect. <laughs> You're asking me how many <laughs> coughs could uh, accurately predict whether someone has COVID or not? Uh, I'll just say I don't know. Um, you know, there's, there's one question with, which is, can it be predicted from the sound of a cough, which isn't an answered question. It's not settled. Um, but yeah, <laughs> if, if, if it were possible, I don't, yeah, I, I have no idea. It depends, like, again, kind of maybe what Kate was saying. Um, what kind of samples you get. Yeah, I, I, like, mean, I would love, so Sean, you had a picture of, um, was it age and height, where your two axes, where you were placing individual people. I'd love to see um, a different coordinate system, many different things you measure about that cough sample and projected to 2D in a way that helps us see how diverse were those coughs um, anyway. And then how did, what was the accuracy of the algorithm for classifying COVID or not? Um, and maybe it's accurate for people over here, but not so accurate over there. That's how you would get a sense of, of whether there was enough of a sample size and whether there was any bias. Um, we, mm. we should talk about it. Um, two things. One, uh, if you click on the red and blue circles, it does uh, re reorient the, orient uh, the, the, the coordinate systems uh, to five different um, Fa factors. I just forgot to do that during the Great. performance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but aside from that, um, I think it's important to mention that um, the, the the algorithms. I mean, people are training uh, neural networks on that data. Yes, but that work doesn't include any sense of the, the those algorithms. It's purely the training data. And for me, that's kind of important because normally when we're confronted with these systems, it's after the fact. It's kind of when they're, when they've been black boxed, when they're implemented and deployed and, you know, are more or less hidden. Um, and I think it's an, an important political moment right now because we have, we see them taking shape, like they are being created and it's worth paying attention to the fact that, that, that they're being created because there is a lot of like, there's, there's a lot happening uh, in terms of how, those tr how that training data is, is being collected, uh, how it's being redistributed, who is participating in it, what projects are making use of it, and so on. So I think, you know, in terms of like developing a politics around um, big data and, mach and AI, uh, yes, we can, we can definitely sort of look at where it goes wrong, but we can also sort of pay attention to this moment right now, which is the production of the data set. Uh, and so that's, that, that's um, I think, just an important thing to emphasize about, about this work. Yeah, I'm conscious my question was a bit provocative, but I think it is a really important one because I think as a society, we talk so much more and for a really good reason about the value of big data, but very few people actually understand what big means and especially in the context of um, data that is related to people's personality or people's health um, yet technically you should have seven billion data points and even then that might not even be enough to accurately uh, accurately identify yeah health issues for instance well and, um, and face recognition on seven billion white men does not make an accurate algorithm on minority totally. groups or anything like that yeah, yeah totally um, we're starting to get a few questions from, from the audience. Uh, some are quite lengthy. Um, there's one question here from our colleagues at the Victorian College of the Arts, Kate, for you, whether there is in your search for the, the sort of deepest blue, whether there is a way um, to reorder 
those data sets um, and achieve very different uh, yeah, visual outcomes and visual results um, rather than, I guess, ever needing a human intervention. So really the machine that trains the machine. Oh, you mean um, in uh, when we took the 306 functions and I used my eyes to say, oh, I don't like those three in a row and swapping it around. Um, yeah, sure. We, we could have automated that fully. I was qu quite having fun <laughs> with that. Uh, but we, we certainly could have written an algorithm to fully automate that if I give it some criteria. So my criteria might have been counting pixels and avoid having uh, too much blue within a certain neighbourhood. I, I could have done that. But it was fun to just do it by... You know, uh, to, to go from, I, I find it fascinating. The one that truly was random wasn't random enough for my taste. Like, but that's the thing about random, like random often, you know, you're going to get three blue in a row sometimes with random, but my brain says that doesn't look random. That looks like I deliberately put three blue in a row. Um, so sometimes you need to manually intervene to make it look more random. Um, there's a thing called um, Benford's law that, uh, that yeah. makes random not really random. Um, and then there's one question here that I absolutely love, and I think it's um, addressed to Sean, but Kate, I wouldn't mind getting your thoughts about it as well, whether the algorithm, uh, and I think the an algorithm should actually be written with a capital T and capital A here, um, whether it fosters a new kind of sociology. Sean, that sounds like it's got Sean written all over it. Um, Kate, yeah, just feel free to jump in as well. And I guess it, it's it's all related to the fact that we as members of society yeah, are more and more governed by algorithms and then how that starts to affect us in our daily routines and habits. Mm. I don't know that I have the capacity to a answer that question, but I will uh, just uh, give a kind of... Um, Acknowledgement to uh, a, an academic whose work I sort of admire from afar is really interesting. Uh, and her name is Beth Singler, and she um, she approaches it from religious studies. So she looks um, she she basically sort of looks at our relationship to um, automation and artificial intelligence uh, th through through the lens of religious practices. And I think uh, there are. Uh, it's sort of a rich <laughs> um, perspective to take. But I'd, yeah, I don't actually know how to answer the question um, uh, in terms of sociology, to be honest. No, I don't either, except my, my perspective would be um, concerns about the impacts in society would um, in some sense justify why I think it's so important to focus on trust. Um, we can develop as many algorithms as we like, but if we don't trust them um, and we haven't done the work to... Uh, provide those trust mechanisms, then their impact in society will be very limited, I hope, <laughs> right? It, the trust is a gatekeeper to the impact that we let algorithms have in society. Um, I hope uh, if we don't have that gatekeeper mechanism and there's, you know, there's a lot of um, thought to go into uh, who should control this, who should be the arbiter of whether an algorithm is trustworthy enough. Um, but if we don't have that and algorithms potentially run amok, um, then huge societal impact. Can I follow up on that, uh, Niels? Absolutely. Uh, just, just uh, there, there was a little excerpt from, from my talk that was actually on the cutting room floor, uh, a, a little bit about trust. So I just thought I would um, uh, digest it or something or regurgitate it or some, something along those lines. But it had to do with this letter that was um, uh, sent to the Lancet last year, late last year. Uh, called Why We Cannot Trust Artificial Intelligence in Medicine. And, um, and the, the, the premise of that was basically that the meaning of trust had been diluted by um, computing and that we tended to kind of assign meanings like um, that, it, that it's accurate. Um, you know, even in cases where the, the data has been more or less debiased, um, then we say that, oh, that's more trustworthy. Um, and they said that there's a conflation that's happening um, between uh, trust in those terms of like accuracy, efficiency, or um, or other ways that it's used in, in computing versus the relationship that uh, exists between a patient and a physician who is uh, both 
who is voluntarily taking the responsibility for the patient's health. And so that kind of like dependent relationship of care and the kind of voluntary nature of the, the relationship is, is a sense like a, like a, a moral responsibility that's diffused um, by sort of AI, you know, in medicine. I couldn't quite figure out how to sort of wor work that in. I'm not, and, and I'm still kind of like coming to terms with like what I, th I think of it, but I do think, yeah, since Kate's brought up trust a few times that, yeah, it's, it's definitely an important kind of concept to, to, to be thinking through and, um, mm. and certainly the different valences that, 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 that it sort of takes, that it's not a monolithic term. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd, I'd like to kind of steer it in a slightly different um, direction and, and uh, hear from you or understand from you how you deal with unexpected outcomes uh, Kate, we spoke last year uh, at an event, I can't remember which one, but you talked about how you found the triptych to be, uh, and I quote, unexpectedly beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, that's really interesting. I'm nowhere near a mathematician. I wish I was. Um, and it's it always felt to me that mathematicians, um, I'm not going to say expect everything, but... <laughs> Uh, are less surprised by unexpected things. Let me put it that way. So it really, yeah, it, it, it really inspires me hearing you say um, that. And it'd be really nice to hear what unexpected means for you as well. Um, uh, for you as well, Sean, I think there were a few recordings that yeah, that included something odd and off, um, or quite a few actually. I think the, the minority actually included cuffs. Um, I heard a few people say, yes, I smoke when I was playing some of the recordings yesterday. Um, yeah, was any of that planned? Uh, what does it tell us also, I think, about anomalies in data? Uh, and I guess that takes us back somewhat to these medical data visualizations that we're being confronted with. But yeah, how do you both deal with the unexpected in your practice? Yeah, so, um, I mean, you're right. At <laughs> As a mathematician, I should not be surprised to see beauty in something so simple because mathematicians see that all the time. I mean, there is so, you know, even... So some people have looked at the individual images and said, oh, are these fractals, right? So fractals, um, the, the, those who may know the, the famous Mandelbrot set or Julia set, they are exquisitely beautiful and generated by the most simple function, you know, like y equals x squared plus c, where c is a complex number. It's just like unbelievably simple that something like that can generate such intricate beauty. So it should not have surprised me. It's just that I didn't see it coming <laughs> with this particular research project. Um, but I'm well aware of the fact that mathematics can, can do that. Um, so no, I, I was just amazed that all these gorgeous functions, all they are is just things we do to X and Y. Like it's just an X and there's just a Y. And all we're doing is very limited vocabulary. It's just, arithmetic and trigonometric operators, basically stuff you do to X and Y that generates astonishingly detailed, exquisite detail. It, it surprised me. Shouldn't have maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I was just trying to furiously think of what uh, my answer would be. <laughs> but, um, how to deal with the unexpected well in that in that work like um for me that's the important th one of the important reasons of looking at training data is that it's like i've you know i've done machine learning projects from the point of view of trying to accomplish something and if you have you know that the very first thing you do is clean the data right you like sort of analyze the data and then you clean out the data you get rid of all the stuff that doesn't conform to um, you know, where people have been like screwing around, you know, entering fake things, you know, you get rid of all that. You only want the real stuff and the good stuff. And then and from there, you can kind of proceed with a project. So looking at it from the programmer's point of view, that's all the stuff you chuck out. Um, so from the from our point of view of looking at this and what is interesting and important about it, I think, you know, th those times where people break the script, uh, where people don't do what's expected of them is important to pay attention to because they do it for 
you know, various reasons. And those reasons can be really interesting and they speak a lot to life in the world. Um, and that's what, you know, we're interested in at some level. But I also think more generally the, the, the unexpected, you know, which comes out in, in technical terms, we often think of the bug or the error, the glitch, that these things are all like potential, you know, ways of kind of circumventing the kind of like dominance of the machine, you know, that we think that, um, um, that somehow when the machine goes wrong, that, that we can see a sort of like opening where we as kind of like fallible humans have a, have a place. So I think we often, um, from an art sort of background, treat the error as, um, as worthy for, for, for that reason. Um, sometimes we try to provoke those kind of errors and problems and misses and things like that. Um, yeah, but again, I'm kind of like going, r rambling a little bit here. Uh, no, but I do think the error is sure. worth, uh, yeah, 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 some thought. Um, I'm conscious of time and we've got two more questions. Um, I think one might take us uh, quite a while to respond to, but it's still worth flagging, I think, because we have been talking about um, yeah, transparent algorithms and algorithms that are unbiased and work um, flaw flawlessly or as flawlessly as possible. Um, there's a question from an anonymous attendee asking how not-for-profits in Australia um, can actually build safeguards to around uh, to alg or around algorithms. Sorry, to ensure that we use AI in, for instance, health services um, in an ethical and inclusive way. Are there currently any ethical codes um, that should be referred to when mm. building those algorithms? Um, I'm aware that very recently New South Wales, um, the chief data scientist in New South Wales, um, Ian Opperman, has set up an AI review committee uh, and the New South Wales government has the first AI strategy underway and an AI ethics policy. Um, I can put an, a link to an article in the chat um, there about that. Um, but, you know, I think government intervention is happening um, yeah. and recognising the, the importance. So I think the not-for-profit sector should be able to, to tap into that. Um, also, I mean, the, the stuff that I've been doing on how we can um, ensure that the, the algorithms are trustworthy and unbiased, et cetera, um, people can just reach out to, to me at University of Melbourne uh, to, to get us to work on um, some collaborative projects if they're interested in, in that. Uh, but I'll, I'll answer that with a link in the, in the chat. Fantastic. Um, yeah, given the time, um, and given your, I guess, yeah, very insightful um, thoughts on all of these questions and your magnificent presentations, I think I'll conclude the Q&A there. Um, from my end, Kate and Sean, again, as I said at the start of this q and I'm really blown away by your very different projects, but how you bring the science into art and vice versa. I think it's, it's really, yeah, really inspiring. There's a heap of questions that I still have that we probably should try to answer over uh, a coffee post lockdown hopefully soon um, thank you very much thank you uh, i'd just like to thank everyone for joining us in this third and final session of the machine forum program and even though we're remote from each other i'm sure you'll want to join me as an audience and thanking our really great panelists today for such a fantastic session um, this this really diverse bringing together of practices is what we really love about putting these forums together um, and I really thank you so much, Niels, for being such a generous respondent. And that was a really fantastic conversation. And to everyone that contributed really good questions. If you've joined us across the week, I'm sure you'll also agree that um, all of our speakers have really contributed to an enlightening ride across the many facets of the broader theme of machine um, in this very strange current moment that we're in. Uh, we really hope that you've enjoyed it. We thank you for your support of our programs and we look forward to bringing you the recorded sessions to the Potter website. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>